President Bolasinibu of Nigeria has presided over his administration's first Federal Executive Council meeting. Uh, he says the current unemployment rate in Nigeria is unacceptable. The government also says it has no intention to borrow from any local or foreign organizations as the benefits of petrol subsidy removal will be plowed back into various sectors of the economy to boost revenue. That's from Loyale Edu, Minister of Finance. Now, he says, that's the Minister of Finance, Nigeria will not be boring to create jobs, but will rather seek to encourage investments. Arise New State House correspondent Adesua Moroan reports. The council chambers of the presidential villa comes alive as President Chinubu convenes his inaugural cabinet meeting, just nine days shy of 100 days in office. In his address, President Chinubu sets the stage, acknowledging the challenges that lie ahead. He places a spotlight on the present issue of unemployment and the state of the economy. The expectation is high and there's a tough time right now. We must work hard, commit ourselves, and create a buoyant economy that will serve every Nigerian. We have from unemployment that is a level that is not acceptable. We are threatened by climate change. But to turn things around, you have been selected to perform your utmost best. The president further emphasizes collaboration among ministers, underscoring the essence of strong leadership. It is all in your hand now. I'm ready to list it. Like I said to the NBA yesterday, I'm ready, even for corrections. Only God is perfect. Don't be afraid to take decisions in this situation that you have been called upon to fetch water from a dry well. Following the closed door deliberations, ministers reaffirmed the president's directives, pledging to turn words into action as quickly as possible. We are looking at different sectors of the economy that will contribute to this job creation. Chief among them is the creative industry and the digital economy. His Excellency has also given the mandate that this has to be done quickly. So um, we should see uh, all of these investments coming into power. We have actually secu secured commitments from investors into power sector, the rail and transportation sector, security architecture, steel, digital backbone, solid minerals. And we are engaging these investors. We also examined the president's eight-point agenda. And those are basically food security, ending poverty, economic growth and job creation, access to capital, particularly consumer credit, inclusivity in all its dimensions, particularly for, as regards youth and women, improving security, improving the playing field on which people and particularly companies operate, rule of law, and of course, fighting corruption. Uh, Mr. President's uh, uh, vision is to ensure that Nigeria recovers uh, lost time as quickly as possible. The coordinating minister of the economy reiterates the administration's departure from past borrowing centered approaches. Clearly, the federal government is not in a position to borrow at this time. Rather, the emphasis has to be on creating a stable macroeconomic environment, stable um, inflation, stable exchange rate, a, and an environment within which people can come and invest. Recently, Nigeria's unemployment rate dropped to 4.1% from 5.3%, thanks to a fresh methodology. While analysts acknowledge ongoing challenges, the resounding message from President Bola Tinubu and his team following the inaugural council meeting today is clear. A determined approach will tackle obstacles head on. From the presidential villa, Adesua Omoruan, Arise News.
All right, let us discuss. Let's get in depth. We have uh, two great guests in our studio with us, uh, Chin Wei Aguim. Uh, she, of course, uh, heads uh, economic strategy, also the chief economist at Coronation Merchant Bank, and uh, Dr. Muda Yusuf, who, of course, is the CEO and director of the Center for Promotion of Private Enterprise. Good morning to the both of you. Thanks for joining us. Um, so. Uh, the Minister of Finance saying that uh, they're going to encourage investments to create jobs. I want, I want to get your thoughts, both of you, on that. Is that, is that possible, Ching? We're starting with you. Yes, I think it's possible. It's yeah. very possible, yeah, because um, increasing borrowings for the sake of jobs will put pressure on the fiscal side of things. So fiscal management is um, a focus right now. Um, so thinking of ways to reduce wasteful spending and if, if, if in doing that, increasing investments to drive job generation is an approach, I think that that's possible. And, yeah. Okay, okay. Doctor? Well, it's, it's, a good, it's a good idea. That is the way to go. Mm. But just as the minister said, uh, we need to fix some fundamentals. Yes. Uh, he talked about the macroeconomic environment. We still have a lot of issues with that, especially with the external sector. I don't know how we are going to go about that uh, without borrowing. Uh, of course, you also have structural issues which you need to fix before you can, you know, get uh, at least foreign direct investors to come into this arena. Uh, of course, you have issues of security. These are major issues that we need to fix to be able to attract uh, investment. And if you look at the numbers, I was looking at the central bank number because I had thought that by now, the securitization deal, which was approved by the uh, National Assembly of yeah. the Ways and Means, yeah. will have been activated. But as at July, net credit to government is still over 32 trillion. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a significant, you know, impact for liquidity and for the macroeconomic stability that uh, the minister is talking about. So it's a major issue from the Naira perspective. Perhaps the situation may not be too bad because of the progress we are making with revenue generation and all the efforts that are on the table. But with the external sector, I think there is still a big, a big issue. Yeah, yeah. I mean, especially looking at what is happening now with the FX and looking at the outlook in the near term and, and, and even to the medium term, it's not looking too comfortable at all. Yeah. So I worry a lot about that. But I agree with him that uh, we need to focus more on investment. But we need to deal with these fundamentals yeah. before we can be expecting investors, particularly FDIs. Yeah. For portfolio flows, well, people have been advocating that we need to increase interest rates and all of that. Portfolio flows are hot money. Yeah. So, so some of us are cautious about running too fast you know, after portfolio flows. But that, that is what it is for now. Gotcha, gotcha. Yeah. I do want to, since mm -hmm. I'm still on, on, on the matter of jobs and creating jobs, this data from the... Um, Bureau of Statistics, this whole revised methodology, the informal sector, and particularly the amount of jobs that the informal sector is responsible for from Q4 2022 to Q1 2020. So there it is, 93.5% of people engaged in employment are in the informal sector. Um, it's 926 for the first quarter. Uh, I want to get your, both of you your takeaways from this. Uh, uh, Chin, we're starting with you. What, what is your takeaway with that amount of jobs in the informal sector? Well, it's not surprising to see that an economy like Nigeria's economy that requires or has a significant portion of Nigeria's, work, Nigeria's workforce um, lacking the necessary skills and education uh, to fill roles in the formal sector. You'd find um, a push or, you, or you, you'd find that there are large numbers of people who are better placed in informal uh, jobs or um, do, doing work in the informal sector. Now, high unemployment and underemployment levels, I know that there's a new methodology, but it doesn't, um, it doesn't um, negate the fact that unemployment levels are severely high still. Um, that would push people to, you know, look for work in the informal economy. Yeah. And um, on the back of that, you'd find that these numbers um, are not... I don't know. I wouldn't. Well, it's it's pretty high because I'm looking at it's, it again. Ninety three point. Yes, I mean, yes, ninety two point six percent. But then um, you you find also that there are some social welfare packages like um, uh, pensions and health care that um, those in the informal sector are not exposed to. But you know, when, when you're thinking about purchasing power, consumer pockets being squeezed, I think the first thing on one's mind is how do I survive? Right. Um, before um, thinking of these um, additional benefits. 
Um, I think to resolve some of, some of these issues, a multifaceted approach has to be used, um, especially with boosting or strengthening the ed educational system, mm. um, skills acquisition. Formal, the formal sector is also not necessarily just education, um, your, the, the university degrees, you have vocationals as well. And that's something I know that I've been reiterating in different interviews that the um, blue collar economy uh, should really be looked into investments into that economy should yeah. be looked into. So where you have your plumbers, the welders, they would now be categorized as informal. But um, if there's some structure into uh, that segment or sect of the economy, I feel like we would see these, these numbers uh, decline uh, significantly. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Munoz, so there's another stat I want to put up here, and this is the size of informal employment by, by regions. I also want to get your answer on this, but I just want to add this here. When you look at Africa, um, so look at this now. Africa has the highest proportion of employment in the informal sector, 85.8%, that is as of 2018, according to the International Labor Organization. The Arab region is 68%, Asia and the Pacific is 68.2%, the Americas is 40%, Europe has the lowest amount. So putting that, and maybe Jimmy Chin, you also want to weigh in on that as well, but Doctor, what's your own take as far as the amount of employment in the informal sector? You see, uh, I agree with those numbers. And when we talk about the resilience of the Nigerian economy, yeah. that is where it is coming from. Those are the guys that are sustaining the economy in spite of all the challenges. Because yeah. there is a whole lot of creativity, innovation, resilience, hard work, and doggedness in that sector. Yeah. Unfortunately, from the point of view of policy, there is no serious attention to the sector. Mm. Because if you are talking about building an inclusive economy, and you have a sector that is delivering over 90% of the jobs, what, what is your policy framework yeah. Yeah. to support that sector? That is one very important, significant uh, value of this report. Of course, there is a controversial component about this 4.1% uh, 4, 4 unemployment, we'll one hour thoughts. week, and yeah. all of that. Yeah, yeah. But from the policy point of view, some, some, something needs to be done, urgently and critically. Because if you are talking about building an economy that is inclusive, this is what it's all about. Mm. If anything, many of the operators in the informal economy have been, have been harassed. The institutions of state are hostile to them. Yeah. I mean, take the average trader, for instance. A government will go to a, a typical market where you have all, the, particularly women, you know, majority of them are women. Yeah, yeah. They demolish the market. In place of that, they go and build a shopping mall. These women cannot afford it. And what you find is that you see all of them hanging on the wrong side. This happens particularly in the, in the cities. The same thing with all these artisans, the blue collar uh, workers that you talk about. I was speaking to a mechanic recently. I just gathered a few of them. Said, if you want the government to do anything for you, mm. what would you want from the government? They say it's workspace. Many of them are squatters, go around the country. They are either operating under the bridges or they are operating under high tension wires. Areas where typically there will be no need to use. And they face all, all sorts of harassment. They say police will come and be asking for particulars of all the vehicles in the garage. Mm -hmm. The uh, local council will come with taxes. The task force will come and be accusing them of environmental sanitation issues and all of that. All of these things are to extort money from them. So there is no clear policy framework. And if you must tackle this unemployment problem, Rather than be worrying about uh, having to formalize them or something like that, let us create a conducive environment for them. Whether they are the artisans, whether they are the mechanics, whether they are the traders and all of that. Because we can see now, their contribution to the economy is close. It's over 60 trillion naira. Yeah. Because they are very dominant in the distributive trade sector. They are also dominant in the, in the agricultural sector. And of course, in the blue collar space. Mm. That is where they are dominant. So if you are talking about mainstreaming, if you are talking about social intervention in a sustainable form, these are the areas that the government needs to deploy policy to face so that we mainstream the informal sector 
I will minimize all this harassment that they face in the hands of state, state agencies. Whether they are security people, whether they are task force, whether they are local government officials. And in all of this, I think the states and the local governments have a very big role to play. Because they are closest to, to, those, the, people. to those people. Yeah. So we, we, we need that kind of intervention. Yeah, yeah. Thank you for that, Doctor. So I want to pick up on one thing the World Bank, some observations that the World Bank made as far as the characteristics of nations that have these high level of uh, informal populations. Um, they said, one of the things they said was that there is um, less access to finance. Um, they said lower labor productivity, slower physical and human capital accumulation, smaller fiscal resources, higher income inequality, poverty, less progress towards sustainable development goals. Just to point out what the World Bank pointed to. Now, I want to get to the economy now. Um, Chinwe, the 2.51% um, GDP growth that we saw in the second quarter, Dr. Muda Yusuf, I also want to get your thoughts as well. Uh, Chiu, what, what, what do you make of the economic growth that we saw in the latest uh, uh, quarter? Well, it was in line with our projection. Um, we had projected uh, a figure that was just 10 basis higher than what was released. Um, so we did expect to see this lagged or slow um, growth. And why I'm calling it slow is because typically second quarter GDP should look healthier than the first quarter right. and also third quarter as well as the fourth quarter. So it was in line with our expectation. Um, but like, if, if I, uh, let me just add a few more thoughts around um, economic growth and sectors that I feel could help in boosting uh, job generation. Okay. Um, so first of all, there are industries, I'll call them industries, that can serve as lubricants or serve as lubricants. And the first one I would say is power. For, for Nigeria to really achieve um, the industrial takeoff that it requires, um, Stable power supply is necessary. Mm. Um, I remember that there was an in-house um, analysis that was done, I think, about five years ago, where we discovered that if power supply is stable uninterrupted, that it could add at least two percentage points to potential GDP growth. Mm. So um, I think first, the first thing to do is to look into power. I know that things, I know movement is happening in that um, segment. Technology is also a catalyst yeah. or a lubricant for um, growth as well. But like taking it back to the actual sectors, I would say that agriculture still remains on that list for me. Um, we've, we've said for so, many, for so long that it really should be the economic backbone of an economy like Nigeria. So I expect to see some forward steps or movements with that sector. Um, technology, of course, um, we heard one of the ministers um, list out some sectors. I think the hospitality sector as well, if we get the right investments into the country, we should see a boost in um, job creation with hospitality. And of course, um, segments under the orange economy. So the orange economy is where you have the creative um, industry. Yeah, yeah. Um, so yeah, like I feel like jobs um, can be generated from that. And definitely last but not least, I would say mining. Mining is a sector that Huge. I feel, yeah, yeah, Nigeria is yet to untap the um, potential um, of that sector. But um, going back to the numbers, Looking ahead for uh, the next quarter, I still expect to see sluggish growth. And when I say sluggish growth, it doesn't necessarily mean that it will be lower than what came in in Q2. Okay. But it wouldn't be as high as one would expect when you mirror it with the national accounts that were released, let's say, maybe three years ago. Yeah. So from a year-on-year -year perspective, we would see like a slowdown. Um, so, yeah, let's hope that the harvest activity may help in some way because for now that is just one of the uh, few positives i see we've seen the issue with fx uh what we've seen with fx depreciation that is definitely going to impact the manufacturing sector mm. um the fall subsidy removal and what is done on uh, purchasing power consumer pockets so we're going to see that impact um trade which is a sector that i refer to as the barometer uh for um other sectors when we're really analyzing the national accounts so, yeah, looking ahead for the next quarter, I, f I feel that um, uh, GDP growth will come in a bit sluggish. Okay, okay. Dr. Miyasu, what's your thoughts on the economic growth we've seen? Well, uh, <clears throat> I think it's, it's uh, fairly okay, uh, given the context in which we find ourselves. Uh, first, you had the uh, issues of the uncertainty that are still lingering right from the period of the election. Right now, we are still talking about uh, election litigations. That right. is still hanging over us. Uh, we had the challenges of forex uh, liquidity, exchange rate depreciation, the problem of insecurity, and uh, the problem of subsidy removal. You know, uh, some of these reforms actually were supposed to have, you know, generated new momentum for growth. Uh, but unfortunately, 
uh, there was a very big backlash as a result of those reforms. You know, and you know, in economics, you cannot accurately predict outcomes because economics is a social science. It's not an exact science. Uh, some of the outcomes we are seeing, and many of us did not foresee it. You know, and unfortunately, it's also having a negative impact. You know, maybe short term though, on on the on the economy. Uh, we have seen the impact on inflation. We have seen the impact on the cost of production. We have seen the impact, especially of the fuel subsidy removal, on a whole number of sectors, you know, which, which has actually depressed economic activities and all of that. So, but these are reforms that are necessary. And I imagine that by the time we step into third to four, uh, fourth quarter, uh, some of the dividends of these uh, reforms uh, will continue. Uh, will now begin to manifest mm. you know, to improve on, on the growth situation. Then we have this very challenging problem of speculative activities. For FX? Yes. Okay. It's a major issue. It's a major issue. And the release of the audit reports by the, of the central bank of about four or six years, it also not help matters mm. because it further fueled the speculative activities. And that is perhaps for me the biggest worry. Uh, we have this intervention from the NMPC, which is a good one, and uh, which for me is better than going to borrow. And that is also in line with what the Minister of Finance said, that they are not going to borrow. They are going to look at investment and all of that. And part of looking for investment is also about looking at which viable entities do we have, you know, through which you can maybe sell some equities or if there are I do assets that you can sell and all of that to boost liquidity, particularly forex liquidity. Mm. Because that is the biggest challenge now. So and we need to move fast to see how we can stabilize that space. Uh, of course, going to IMF and all of that is not it's not it's not a good thing. I don't think it's an option at this time. Hmm. But if you need to think outside the box. <laughs> Everybody's going to the IMF or uh, yes, Ghana, yes. If we, if we can avoid it. No, okay. no, if we can avoid it. Okay, Although okay. the situation is quite, is quite, uh, is, is quite uh, disturbing yeah. the way it is. Yeah. But if you can avoid it, and I think that is the sense I can get from what Mr. Wale was talking about. Yeah. They are not going to borrow. They will be looking more in the direction of investment. Hmm. And what that means is that Either people are coming in with FDI or the government itself is making equity available to attract to attract some effects. Just as the some Saudi Aramco did. Right. Saudi Aramco sold just 1.5 percent of their shares and brought in over billions, say, yeah. 25 billion US dollars. Yeah. You yeah. know, and that went a long way. Mm. You know. So we also have a few of the, particularly in the oil and gas area. Although I know there are some sentiments around you are selling assets, you are doing this. You yeah. know. There is this uh, sentiment that is a very negative thing, but it's not always the case. If you have a major liquidity challenge, there is nothing. If you have valuable assets, there is nothing that says you cannot leverage on those assets to raise to raise some funds yeah. to boost your liquidity. Gotcha. Uh, yeah. We only got three minutes to go. I sort of get some final thoughts. I've asked a yeah. lot of analysts this question. Should we write off 2023? Should we really look to see gains in 2024? Because this is already, in fact, August is over in a couple of days. So we're in September already. Uh, Chimwe, let me start with your, your final thoughts. Do we look to 2024 to start to see impact of reforms or do we any gains still to be made in what's left of this year? Well, for me, I would say the trickle down effects should um, be visible next year, 2024. But again, when you ask that question, it's 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 really like a mixed answer you would get because you have different indicators. Yeah. Uh -huh. So. Um, with regards to growth, I would I would expect um, to see healthier growth figures towards the end of next year. Um, for inflation, inflation figures are still relatively high on our um, on our model, um, but uh, slightly lower, but still um, high double digit levels. Um, with regards to the policy rate, that's something I would say we're um, you know really monitoring. Um, to see what, what would happen there. But um, it's just, it's an interesting spot to be in because if you're chasing with inflation targeting, you would understand the rate hikes. But when you understand um, what is going on with regards to boosting growth for the economy, trimming is required. 
So that is an indicator that um, I'm really um, intently looking at. <laughs> um, yeah, FX, um, there have been a lot of um, announcements and comments around boosting um, FX liquidity um, sources. And that is really what is causing, um, it's, it's just this whole demand supply game with um, FX. So right. um, staying, staying cautiously optimistic and expecting to see um, some level of appreciation still at high levels mm. um, next year. Um, yeah, um, not below 700 naira per USD right, right now. Right. That's what my projection um, um, is articulating. So. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So, so, so some optimism there, Doctor Buda. So if you get well, the last word, uh, what are you expecting? I, I'm also <laughs> cautiously optimistic yeah. uh, uh, because of the reforms that has been taking place and all of that. But we need to address the social aspect of all this whole process because the social environment needs to be right. Yeah or also even make progress with these reforms. To the man on the streets, all this talk about GDP and all of that, it doesn't make yeah. any, any, any sense to them. Yeah, yeah. What is important is what we can do, and I, and I believe it is possible, to bring down the cost of food, to bring down the cost of transportation, mm. and to bring down the cost of energy. Okay. All over the world, governments play a major role in all of these areas to protect the vulnerable segments of the society. Mm. Just talk about the informal sector and how heavily neglected they are. Yeah. So we can deploy policies, we can deploy our tariff policy, we can deploy our tax policies, at least to deliver some immediate relief, mm. apart from just distributing money and all of that. I think if we do that, that, that will also go a long way. Excellent stuff. Thank you mm. both so much for joining us. Chinwe Egrim, Chief Economist at Coronation mm. Merchant Bank. Uh, and of course, Dr. Muda Yusuf, uh, CEO Director at the Center for Promotion of Private Enterprise, because the private sector that will get us out of this mess. Thank you both <laughs> Thank you. for joining us. Appreciate your time.